to ensure that I have a seat at the table, even beyond board meetings, but in mentorship and guidance. My favorite memory of ours was at a Board of Governors meeting in which former President Genshaft's farewell video was being played. Included in the video was her first student body president, Tyvee Smalls, speaking to his experience of her credibility as a leader. After the video ended, I looked to you and I said, I'm your first student body president, in which you responded, I took note of that. <laughs> At that moment, we both understood that in the future, 10 or more years from now, people will be celebrating the accomplishments that you have made for the University of South Florida. They will call upon me to speak to your leadership capabilities, and I will be featured in a video boasting about the strides you were able to make, we were able to make together and the accomplishments I know you will make long after I have graduated. I know I am your first student body president, but let it be known that I will forever be your favorite. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, President Corral, for your mentorship, and congratulations on your lucky seven. Thank you, Brittany. Now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing two esteemed speakers who have been colleagues, mentors, and friends to President Corral throughout the years. I'd like to call to the podium the Reverend Ronnie Osborne, pastor of St. Charles Presbyterian Church in Missouri. Reverend Osborne is President Corral's best friend. They grew up in Missouri together and attended grade school, junior high, high school, and later, Baylor University together. We are pleased that Reverend Osborne is with us today to celebrate this historic occasion. Please welcome the Reverend Osborne. I didn't notice that, isn't this where I'm supposed to take up an offering? You <laughs> promised me an offering. What a blessing and honor to be here today and bring you greetings from the great show me state of Missouri, Steve's, I mean Dr. Stephen Christian Corral's home state. But I also bring you greetings from St. Louis where Steve's mom Connie and his dad Jim grew up and where I now live. You might be wondering why a Presbyterian pastor is speaking at an important academic inauguration. Well, to put it simply, since Mrs. Christensen's first grade class at Boone Elementary, I have been Steve's best friend, brother, and confidant. So I know the man. So I'm here not just to support Steve and Cheyenne, but to let you know the man behind the curtain, the one behind all those degrees and prestigious academic titles and accomplishments and honors. So here's what I wanted to tell you about Steve before it was edited for confidentiality, <laughs> security clearance, and time. Uh, unfortunately, the only thing that was left behind was, was this. <laughs> President Steve Corral is a great guy and you're lucky to have him. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, there are things Steve and I have experienced together that have made us the men we are today. We have truly been blessed, and Steve actually is the lucky one for you to have this wonderful opportunity here at the University of South Florida. But you all need to know that Steve's journey was not always a straight one, but through the, the years he embraced all his experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he let God use them to transform him into the man of faith and integrity, diligence, compassion, humor, and intellect that he is. But like I've alluded, it wasn't always easy, nor what path he was actually going to take always clear. A little background. Steve grew up as an only child raised by two loving parents. And the best thing that Mr. and Mrs. Crowell did was allow Steve to be Steve. 
And even though they were intellects and social activists and very worldly, they never gave up on Steve, who really was not any of those things. <laughs> no, Steve, as a child and a youth, was interested in four things. Sports, girls, fun, and girls. <laughs> Steve saw school as an opportunity to advance those interests. Now, now, don't get me wrong, he wasn't a bad student. He just wasn't a great student. I'd say above average, and I'm probably being nice, right? But it wasn't about ability that held him back, but his effort. Steve was focused on other things, like stealing my girlfriend, Kathy Rice, from me in sixth grade. <laughs> by, by the way, Steve, I forgive you for that. Then there was baseball and football and track in our teenage years. And Steve excelled in those sports, lettering multiple times in both football and track and winning a city championship in baseball. Steve was also on the basketball team in junior high, but as to playing, I wouldn't exactly call it that. Steve was called the enforcer. He came off the bench to do the hack-a-shack on the opposing team's hottest player. And he knew his ability, or lack of it, but he also knew his role, and he did it extremely well. I tell you all of this to let you know that Steve understands the importance of being part of a team, of not being afraid for an honest self-evaluation. That's why he has always surrounded himself with the very best people, people better than himself in some things, so that he can be challenged, he can work hard and get better at those things. And this was especially true when he went away to college. When Steve went to Kansas State, as scripture says, he put away childish things and he got down to business at being a student. And even though he didn't have the foundational classes he needed and the learn study habits that many classmates possessed, he refocused his energy and he buckled down and Steve became an outstanding student. At Baylor, something clicked for him and his focus changed to the world of academics and you see the results today. Now that doesn't mean Steve was a scholastic monk. Steve did find time for other things, but only after he was done with his studying. This should give any person here at this university hope and a great example to follow. His educational and professional success is built on the foundation of real life that he learned from his parents and his coaches and his friends and his life experiences. And that foundation got stronger when he met Cheyenne at Cornell Library. And I could tell you that was the only time Steve was interested in someone he met in the library, <laughs> especially since she was and still is smarter than Steve. Cheyenne, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for how you've challenged Steve, that you've loved Steve, and you supported his dreams. This is the only Steve Corral that I know. He's been an integral part of my life for 55 years, and I and his. So it's with confidence I say that the University of South Florida is blessed to have Dr. Stephen Christian Corral as your seventh president. I know without a shadow of a doubt that Dr. Corral will not just build on this great foundation you've already have, but will take you to heights that you've never dreamed possible with the support of the Board of Trustees, the faculty, and administration. I promise you, he will not let you down. My friends, you are in great hands with your seventh president, but more importantly, your dreams and visions are now possible with Steve's open leadership, unbelievable intellect, and creative mind. President Steve Corral really is a great guy, and you are lucky to have him. God bless, and go Bulls. Thank you, Reverend Osborne. 
I now have the pleasure of introducing Sir Malcolm Grant. Sir Malcolm is the former president and provost at University College London, former chairman of the National Health Service, and the current honorary chancellor of the University of York in England. Sir Malcolm was the president of University College London when Dr. Corral accepted a position in 2005 as the founding professorial chair in the Department of Management, Science and Innovation in the Faculty of Engineering Sciences. Sir Malcolm's leadership and vision was pivotal in President Corral's decision to accept a position at UCL. Both President Corral and Sir Malcolm share a very, very strong interest in global higher education and the role of universities in the modern world. Sir Malcolm will provide us with a unique perspective on how universities can transform into global leaders, as well as provide an introduction of President Corral. Sir Malcolm. Well, thank you so much, Provost Wilcox, and it gives me enormous pleasure this afternoon to introduce to you your new president, the seventh president of USF, Dr. Steve Corral. It's um, an amazing opportunity, isn't it, also to recall the opportunity that comes to him by virtue of his six predecessors, who took this university from a startup in 1956 into an opportunity which has the scale and the prospect and the potential that they provided him with. What a great time to become president of the university. But what's, what's the job that we're actually asking him to take on? My view is that the, um, we should have no doubt that to be the president of a university is simply the greatest job around. It's undoubtedly the most fulfilling and most enjoyable of all jobs. You've got the benefit of being immersed in a community of amazingly smart people, many of them smarter than yourself. They're called students. <laughs> they and the faculty are the lifeblood of the institution as well. So great academic colleagues are what makes a, an institution work, and they're chosen for their critical faculties. So um, I would also say that um, a great university is therefore a very lively place indeed. But they're nothing without the rest of the team. The rest of the team, the technical staff, the administrative staff, and all the others who ensure that the institution actually functions, that it actually works. So an incoming president can often draw on a deep well of goodwill in a modern university. Loyal colleagues are anxious for their new president to succeed. But no incoming president can afford simply to reply on the warm pillow of welcoming goodwill. Universities are complex institutions. The new president quickly comes to appreciate the local peculiarities of the institution. Time-hardened presidents like me will tell you that it's commonly the case that it's the law school that attracts endless litigation, the economics department whose financial forecasts are always awry, the architects who have the ugliest building on campus because they can't agree upon the architect who could restore it, and the anthropologists who engage in primitive tribalism. <laughs> Though it's a relatively young institution, USF is a classical comprehensive university. It's got this broad range of academic disciplines across the board, and it offers an equally broad range of undergraduate and postgraduate programs. And what I love about it it attracts a diverse body of students from across the state and beyond, places research at the heart of all that it does, and it recognizes that research is a globally competitive function, and that the dissemination of the outcomes of research is best done not only through publication, which is the classical mold, but also through the education of generation after generation of students. This is a much larger a much more receptive audience than those who actually read learned journals. So 
For me, research is not some abstract concept. It's the fundamental activity that generates the new ideas, the new insights, the new technologies, and new ways of thinking. The very best of research has an impact that goes well beyond the walls of the academy. So the heritage has long been thus. Universities have a fantastically long lineage. Great ancient universities of Europe, including Oxford and Cambridge, have more than eight centuries behind them. Their foundation, and indeed most of their existence, predates any of the modern institutions of national democratic government. It, but it's not only this longevity, but their consistency over time that marks them out as such valuable institutions. Actually, the governance models of those two universities in particular have resisted almost all reform over the centuries. Now, I had to discover this for myself. Personally, when I was Pro Vice Chancellor of Cambridge 20 years ago, and um, I was tasked with bringing about some modest reforms to the modernization of the governance of the university. And this included a proposal to confer upon the president of the university, who we called Vice Chancellor, the formal office of chief executive officer, as opposed to chairman of all of the university's committees. So there was heated debate across the campus and meetings were held and eventually these modest proposals were brought out to a ballot of the entire academic staff of Cambridge. And they were enthusiastically rejected. <laughs> so the gorgeous academic regalia that we see here in the auditorium today owes much to that medieval concept of universities and the medieval ecclesiastical system of higher education, and also actually to our innate conservatism as universities. Hence the gowns, the monkish hoods, and the variety of headwear. I have to say, ironically, on practically every graduation or commencement ceremony at which I've presided, I've told our graduating class to go out and to be individuals and to steer their own path through society whilst clothing them all in identical medieval gowns. <laughs> There's an irony in that. But these, these traditions are symbolic, not only of that history, but much more of the common commitment that universities have today to certain fundamental values. Any university that is worthy of that name and status has an obligation to protect and enhance freedom of expression and particularly in an era when that is under threat across the world, even in our two oldest democracies. And equally, an obligation to protect academic freedom, to pursue inquiry, even into areas which are controversial and potentially unpopular. In the political confusion of today's world, universities absolutely must continue to stand out as the cathedrals of independent thought and as the boiling cauldron of ideas. Because the great philosopher Bertrand Russell once said, most people would rather die than think, and most people actually do. <laughs> we need our universities. But what are the measures of success? Well, for USF, it is by any standards an enormously successful university. But how do we know how successful, and where should its future ambitions lie? These are the challenges that face its new president. Although universities have a model of governance that resembles that of the modern commercial corporation, and although they obviously must be run on business lines, they do not have the usual measures of success of a business corporation, such as financial profit and loss. Their currency is ideas. Their currency is education, not dollars and cents. Intrinsic values of a university are much more difficult to measure. So we tend to measure them in terms of inputs and outputs that are reasonably quantifiable, and to do so increasingly through reliance on league tables. So a word or two about league tables. In 2003, the only well-developed system was entirely American, that of US News and World Report which compares and continues to compare transparently the performance of universities and colleges in this country, and does so in a manner which, as President Carroll will talk about in a moment and others have mentioned, is 
a way of measuring and comparing the performance of a particular university over the years. This approach has served the country well, but it's since been transferred to a global stage where the measures are rather more difficult to equate across different universities and across different cultures from across the world. It is more controversial, given the vast differences that universities have in their aspirations and their size. So it's no surprise that at the top of the global league table sit the ancient universities and the great and famous universities, Oxford, Harvard, Stanford, and of course UCL. But um, there are risks with the global application of league tables which are applicable within America across the world. Indeed, it would not be credible if the league tables didn't have that group of institutions at the very top. Uh, they wouldn't be trusted as league tables because we all know those are great institutions. And th when they're ranked in the top five or ten, the movement between them every year is minimal. And so it should be because universities do not change enormously in one year. What it takes is year after year of effort and input and I inspiration. So, these league tables are based upon an ideal model. It's the Anglo-American large, fully comprehensive university. It's working uh, with um, students. It's working and publishing in the English language. But these indicators of success relate primarily to, success, to research and to the volume of research funding and outputs and publications in respected journals and to their citation by other respected scientists and scholars. To do well in these league tables, it helps, therefore, to have a medical school and life sciences because these have been parts of the university which have been heavily invested in in recent years. But there is an issue here. This approach can arguably crowd out what really matters, yet is much more difficult to measure quantitatively, which is the transformation of people's lives that universities have. Wonderful teaching can be found equally in small institutions as in great institutions. We can't quantify this in dollars and cents or in citations, but we do have to recognize the huge value of the institutions like USF, who take students who are first-generation students coming into higher education and provide for them a life-changing experience. These institutions truly deserve respect and recognition. We've got to accept, of course, that higher education has shifted rapidly from being an expectation of a privileged few in society to being a legitimate expectation of many. And that is true not only in the UK and in the US, but across the world. The rising demand will continue globally. As the incomes of millions of people in China and in India and in Indonesia, Africa, and Latin America grow, so they seek a college education for their children. Now, China's responded powerfully to that demand, investing heavily in improving the quality of its universities and building new facilities and new institutions. But the impact of global competition there is in the, in the rest of the world, uh, with league tables as their guide, has started to change events and perceptions. In particular, it's spurred competition. It's revitalized the business of higher education around the world. Higher education is no longer a statewide or national institution. And not every country has the Anglo-American model of a modern university. So, across continental Europe, for example, this Anglo-American model is, is not well known. The great nations of France and Germany who have outstanding science and scholarship do not find it concentrated in the universities. In Germany, for example, the great volume of research is to be found in institutions such as the Max Planck Institutes and the Goethe Institutes and not so much in the, in the universities themselves. In France, it's the Grands Ecoles, it's the institutions funded by government bodies and by philanthropic bodies. In China and in Russia, it's been much more national academies of science where the research has taken place in the past. The problem historically, therefore, has been that these great nations with great research are almost invisible in global league tables. 
and these governments of these countries are taking the necessary steps to change that. Despite huge cultural resistance, huge reforms are now underway in all of their countries. And their purpose is to defragment the environment of teaching and research, to recombine them back into universities in the great traditions originally advocated by Humboldt, and to bring the bulk of the nation's research output under the governance of revitalized universities through ambitious programs of complicated mergers. In France already, great mergers are occurring in Paris, Strasbourg, Bordeaux, Toulouse, and Lyon. I serve as advisor to the French government and to the Russian government and have witnessed these struggles at first hand. But what comes through so powerfully is a sense that higher education is a globalized service industry and that this is truly the decade of opportunity for universities worldwide. This is a paradigm of competition that will drive improvement and change across the world. But there's another paradigm which is equally important, and that's the paradigm of collaboration. The increased competition is coming, and USF is clearly well positioned to perform brilliantly in competitive environments. But it's important not to remember the great strengths that universities can bring when they combine in different ways. Let me put forward two or three different models of what is occurring and what will be the future of these great universities. The first is internal collaboration. One of the great things that a university president can do is work at breaking down the silos, the 19th century silos of knowledge in the way in which we've organized knowledge and research across our universities because we now know that so much more can be done through an interdisciplinary cooperation across the university. We're seeing amazing breakthroughs, I mean, quite stunning breakthroughs that probably 20 years ago were unimaginable between such previously diverse fields as biology and engineering, for example, and uh, between medicine and nanotechnology, for example. Uh, and with modern computing power enabling new insights to be generated, we're actually starting to see a collision now between the complexity of medicine and the complexity of data and analytics. And in the field of life and health sciences, this research effort is, is simply uh, truly transformative. Let me just take one example, which is the uh, convergence of, of medical science and data science with the advent of genomics and multiomics. These technologies will completely transform our understanding of human biology, uh, using data analytics, we can start to solve problems that previously were insoluble or would have taken hundreds of years to solve, including machine learning and ultimately artificial intelligence with wholly new insights into human biology. There is a program being undertaken at the moment to try to understand the folding of proteins, for which the hypothesis is that proteins have more ways of folding than there are atoms in the entire universe. Imagine that as a challenge for data science. So we enter an era of new disease uh, management and assessment and new interventions to bring us to a more personalized model of medicine. Machine learning, by the way, is already transforming radiology. It's already allowing us to look at digital radiological slides across different technologies and to analyze them faster, cheaper, and more accurately than has been able to be performed in the clinic. So um, many of these breakthroughs are the product of work that is being done, open collaborations in our great universities and with industrial partners. There is collaboration number one, universities in the driving seat. Some fear that these developments will lead to redundancies, ultimately amongst doctors and other clinical staff. They won't. In fact, what we're going to see is the practice of medicine being much better informed, much better focused, and by clinicians who have been educated and trained in radically different ways from those historically. So the second level we see global collaborations between scholars and scientists. And this phenomenon has been driven across Europe by the highly competitive funding environment of the European Research Council, 
which has insisted upon the establishment of networks between countries, between universities, as a precondition of funding. And more recently, as a precondition of funding, the feminization of science and the insistence that uh, women are accorded the necessary support to allow them to star in our laboratories. And then there's another third area where collaboration must prevail, and that is, I believe, one in which USF can play a major part, and that's collaboration between universities from across the world. Collaboration in addressing the problems of a global nature whose challenges are so great as to be unable to be resolved by any single institution operating alone. There will be, I know, a spread of collaborations in which we put to one side our competitive instincts and work out what it is that we can make the greatest impact for society by doing together and with the private sector and with philanthropic support. That is the global context of USF for the next 10 years. The point is that only universities can do this. Only universities have that unique capability of assembling the disciplines. Their spread and intensity of multidisciplinary expertise means they can do things that are beyond the reach of governments, beyond the reach of the private sector, and beyond the reach even of individual philanthropists. So, has there ever been a better time to be a university president and to understand the potential for USF in this rapidly changing global context? It's obvious, isn't there, that there are great great foundations upon which President Corral is going to be able to build. It's obvious that this university welcomes its new leadership. And let me say a few words about leadership. Many volumes have been written about leadership. Management wisdom has been devoted to this theme, yet it remains surprisingly elusive when I was appointed president of UCL all those years ago, two of our respected colleagues at the London Business School sent me a book that they'd just written. And it was entitled, Why Would Anyone Want to Be Led by You? <laughs> that's, a colleague, that, that's a question that's vexed me a lot, and also my colleagues at UCL. Why would anyone want to be led by you? Do you know, you have to keep thinking about that. What is it? What is it? that makes a leader and distinguishes them from anybody else. And I've been involved in many appointments at a senior level in universities and in public service across the land. Most of them have been a success, but not all of them. The ones that we thought were going to be safe appointments unfortunately turned out to be safe appointments. And um, no pulse was ever quickened by a safe appointment. <laughs> Others on whom we thought we were willing to take a risk proved to be too high risk. And um, I have witnessed the departure of presidents from universities under, un, after an unsatisfactorily short time because of fundamental errors in understanding the institution and in providing the leadership that they needed. And I've also seen universities stagnate under unexciting leadership. There is a very difficult balance because I've also seen universities thrive and scale and grow and impact and reputation. It's not just the president who does this, but the wise president has an approach to their leadership. So what makes the difference? What makes a great university president? I would argue that the first answer to that is that heroic models of leadership, heroic models of leadership are very rarely well suited to universities even when they're underpinned by inspiration and brilliance, if they fail to win over the faculty who are professional skeptics, then it's not going to work. Leadership is a team sport, and it's a contact sport, and a great leader inspires and energizes others. Secondly, although we expect a university president to possess and display all the essential characteristics of energy, charisma, stamina, articulacy, what they equally need is a strong, hard-headed, analytical capability. They need to be pretty shrewd. They have to have the skill to draw together a compelling vision 
for the institution and a set of tactics for its execution and for achieving the outcomes that they want. Leadership is not administration. Leadership isn't management. It's a higher calling, and few possess the attributes, certainly in the way in which your incoming president does. Thirdly, style and tone. Transparency, approachability that conveys the community a sense of hope. Hope, that above all is what leadership is about. That's the essence of leadership. The president is never off duty. Every appearance, every comment, even body language, is being silently observed and absorbed and largely misinterpreted across the entire <laughs> organization. It's a, tough, it's a tough job. And then, and fourthly, genuine interest and genuine concern and accountability for all the stakeholders to whom the president and the university have responsibility. Be assured that Dr. Corral has all of these virtues. A research career in psychology and organizational behavior, well, how could you better frame a bio for a university president than to have studied those difficult and demanding subjects? International experience, including his time at UCL, where we first met 15 years ago, followed by sure-footed transformational leadership at Rice, at UC Davis, and at Southern Methodist. Above all, he's got a deep understanding of this rapidly changing global context of higher education, of the new functions of competition and of collaboration, and of its challenges and its opportunities. So this is neither a high risk nor a safe appointment. It's an exciting appointment. It's an exciting appointment for this new global era. But there's another question. The appointment panels are always rather nervous in asking. Yet the answer is both relevant and important. I'm not going to state the question, but I'm going to state the answer. It's Dr. Cheyenne Carroll. You've not appointed a president, you've appointed a team. And I've had the huge privilege of knowing them for 15 years. <laughs> Honesty compels me to report to you that you have made an outstanding choice in appointing a great president and a great team. Do you know Dutch universities? They want a special title for their president, which I've always sneakily envied in which I commend to you for President Carroll. It's called Rector Magnificus. <laughs> Allow me formally to introduce your new president as we come to the focal point of today's ceremony, the formal installation of Stephen C. Corral as the seventh president of the University of South Florida, and the installation will be conducted by the Board of Trustees Chair, Jordan Zimmerman. Thank you. Thank you, and I don't have any stories about Dr. Corral yet, but the Board of Trustees is excited to continue the great trajectory of this university under Dr. Corral's leadership. It is a great pleasure and privilege to confer the University of South Florida's highest office upon Dr. Stephen C. Corral. Today, Dr. Corral will formally receive the symbol of his new office, the President's Medallion, which he will wear around his neck at honors, convocations, commencements, and other presidential ceremonies. And its weight is a reminder of the heavy responsibilities that must be willingly carried by all who occupy positions of leadership and the design on its face, a reproduction of the university seal, is a representation of the large community he now serves. Dr. Corral, will you please come forward?
Today is the distinguished company of university officials, scholars, esteemed guests, and community. We have all come together to confer that high office on Dr. Stephen C. Corral. Let me show you again the medallion. My words to Dr. Corral and the trustees' words as well. You have been duly selected to serve as president of the University of South Florida, as chair of the University of South Florida's Board of Trustees. I formally install you in that office with all its requisite rights, privileges, and responsibilities. By accepting the president's medallion, you accept the charge to serve with diligence, dedication, energy, vision, integrity, and honor as you carry out the duties of the President of the University of South Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, please come forward. I present to you the seventh president of the University of South Florida, Dr. Stephen C. Corral. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chair Zimmerman. Your confidence in your leadership means so much to me. Thank you for this extraordinary stewardship opportunity. Sir Malcolm, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I've greatly valued our friendship since that day in 2005 when I first met you in your office at University College London to discuss our plans for founding a new academic department in the Faculty of Engineering Sciences. Your remarks have illuminated for all of us the fascinating dynamics of global higher education and considerations for how university leaders can further strengthen their institutions. I also wish to sincerely thank Professor Maria Dixon Hall for that inspiring invocation. What a wonderful way to set the tone for today's events. Maria, you are a special spirit and a dear friend. Thank you. And to Reverend Osborne. <laughs> Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that was an instance of trust because I did not see his remarks ahead of time. <laughs> but I do trust him, and he's been a friend for decades and in many, many ways helped me get to this stage today. Thank you for your friendship. Provost Wilcox, Professor Stanish, P President Dez, and all the representatives of the students, alumni, foundation staff who are here with us, thank you for your generous welcome and for all you do to support USF. I also wish to recognize Chair Lautenbach and members of our Board of Governors, colleagues from across the State University System of Florida, as well as our USF Board of trustees. And to my dear wife, Cheyenne, ever since the very first day we met at Cornell in 1988, 31 years ago, you have been a source of love, support, inspiration, and wise counsel. None of this would be possible without you. I also wish to thank my father, Jim Corral, for attending today. He traveled a long distance. Yes, thank you. 
He traveled a long distance to be with us, and I'm grateful for his courage and his love as a father for the past 61 years. Without his steady hand and counsel, I would have not made it through college, much less had any career at all. My mother passed away in 1989, so she is not physically here today, but my Christian faith gives me confidence that her spirit is here, and I know that she is encouraging me as she did so well for many years. Finally, I would like to warmly recognize the many members of the faculty who are with us here today from the University of South Florida and those representing universities from all over the world. Your presence represents the strength of the global community of scholars, educators, and intellectuals, a community dedicated to the betterment of society and the development of future generations. Now, speaking of educators, each of us here today probably had one, perhaps more than one, educator who inspired us and believed in us even when we did not believe in ourselves. I've benefited from more educators than I can list, but I offer one thank you to an educator who impacted me, and this example illustrates the insight, the even uncanny insight, that some educators have about young people. Now, despite the fact that I have pursued an academic career, at the age of 15, I can assure you I was anything but an intellectual. But Ms. Marilyn Williams, my ninth grade librarian at Center North Junior High School in Kansas City, Missouri, recognized in me at this early age potential that I didn't even know I had. Here is an image of what Ms. Williams, who is in the white shirt in this photo, wrote in my school yearbook in 1974 when I was 15 years old. Dear Steve, I think you're an intellectual. You just don't know, know it yet. I really enjoyed having you in the library this semester. Good luck at the high school, Marilyn. Little did Mrs. Williams know that I would later have an academic career. Doesn't that show the insight that many educators can have about young people and students? Educators have a wonderful capability to shine a light on a young person's promise. And so the journey brings us here today. I believe that a university presidency is a position of unselfish service and stewardship. I wish to express my deepest gratitude to the USF community for the faith you have placed in me to help steer this great university into what, I, what will hopefully be the greatest era yet. As president, I see myself as a humble relay runner who builds on what those before me have accomplished, such as former presidents Betty Castor and Judy Genshaft, who are with us today. As that relay runner, I will hopefully contribute to what those after me will achieve. Indeed, this event is less about me personally than it is about an opportunity for our community to pause and reflect on how far we have come and to remember the foundation upon which we were built. And most importantly, it is a time to look ahead and to imagine an audacious new future for the University of South Florida. It is a time for us, together, to ask a critical question. What is our strategic identity as a university? Who are we? What do we stand for? I would submit for your consideration that the answer to these questions is in a unique juxtaposition of two concepts. This juxtaposition is this. The University of South Florida is an institution where, where both excellence and opportunity converge. So let me explain about that. 63 years ago, in 1956, Florida state leaders recognized the need to create not just a new university, but a new type of university. The University of South Florida should meet the needs of a dynamic urban metropolitan region. It should have a highly relevant curriculum, 
and it should hold a spirit of service and strong partnerships with the surrounding community. That's an exciting mission. The university had modest beginnings, as shown in this early days image of the front entrance of our campus. Yes, that is actually the front entrance of the campus. You see here a long, dusty road surrounded by a barren terrain with a few trees and sand spurs. Now, being from the Midwest, I didn't even know what a sand spur was until I moved to Florida, but I've learned that more than anything, people just want to get rid of sand spurs. So our university has evolved a great deal since our founding. I'll say more about that in just a minute. In fact, in 1956, our university was emblematic of a new type of university that was coming into vogue. Clark Kerr, former president of the University of California and one of the fathers of modern day higher education, was at that time developing ideas that were inspired by the impactful land grant universities around the country. Land grant universities were founded in the early 1860s with the signing of the Morrill Act by Abraham Lincoln. Their mission was to serve their communities through the agricultural and mechanical arts. Now, it's amazing that Lincoln had the foresight to support such public universities, as if he did not have enough to do in 1862 during the height of the Civil War. But many years later, Kerr recognized the distinctive value of land-grant universities through the service that they provided to their states and communities. And in 1968, he extended that concept of a service-oriented university to what he called the Urban Grant University. In Kerr's mind, an Urban Grant University should come with its shirt sleeves rolled up in service to urban communities. So USF's founders certainly shared Kerr's sentiments, creating what was the very first university in Florida to be founded with a comprehensive mission intentionally placed in a vibrant urban center in Florida. USF's first president, John Allen, put it this way during his first student convocation in 1960. We have an unparalleled opportunity to build on the best of the past to produce a new future characterized by excellence. So I share this historical background to emphasize that at USF's core, it is a very special expectation, a responsibility that is unique to us in this state. Now, like all great universities, we are first and foremost guided by the ideals of higher education the noble search for truth, the dissemination of knowledge, and the fierce protection of freedom of expression, speech, and inquiry. But at USF, our mission is so much more than that of traditional establishments of higher education. Our impact stretches so much farther than our campus walls, out to the communities of Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, Manatee, and beyond. As a 21st century urban research university, the unbridled ambition with which we were founded calls us to greater levels of achievement, namely a commitment to academic excellence, as President Allen explained. Yet at the same time, USF has a societal commitment to support upward economic mobility and regional economic development, to support opportunity. These seemingly incompatible aims, excellence and opportunity, are, in my opinion, anything but mutually exclusive. To the contrary, when people ask me what is unique about the University of South Florida, my response is that our identity captures this seemingly paradoxical juxtaposition of excellence and opportunity. So as we reflect on our past and look forward to our future, It is the convergence of excellence and opportunity, and specifically the renewal and deepening of them that will be the hallmark of our next institutional era. Let us explore the university's commitment to excellence. Next year, in 2020, for the first time in our region's history, all of the Tampa Bay will be served by a nationally ranked preeminent public university the fastest rising public university in the country. 
You bet. As we've mentioned today, over the past 10 years, no other public university in the country has risen faster among U.S. News and World Report rankings than the University of South Florida. We have welcomed increasingly competitive students, with our fall 2019 freshmen having an average ACT score of 28, which is the 90th percentile, and a high school grade point average of 4.13. Not to mention our incoming Morsani College of Medicine students whose average MCAT scores of over 515 place us among the top medical schools in the country. Meanwhile, our student athletes have succeeded spe spectacularly in the classroom and on the field and on the court. Our student athletes have won a total of 120 conference championships in our history, including just recently our women's soccer team. You bet. Our football team has reached 150 wins faster than any university in the state of Florida. And our women's basketball team recently knocked off the number 15 ranked University of Texas Longhorns. You bet. So during its relatively short institutional history of about 60 years, USF's ascent in the higher education landscape has been remarkable. The university ranks 25th among public universities in the nation in total research expenditures at nearly $600 million. USF ranks 7th among public universities in the nation and 16th among all universities worldwide in creating new patents. USF, re USF received the 2019 American Council on Education Award for Institutional Transformation for its Student Success Initiative to elevate student retention and graduation rates. USF is one of, the, one of only three universities in Florida and the first located in an urban area to achieve preeminence based on the performance metrics state, set by the state legislature and monitored by the Florida Board of Governors. <clears throat> Consider our faculty excellence as well. Our faculty includes 14 members of the National Academies. And as of 2018, USF has a total of 65 fellows of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And this places us fourth worldwide with the most AAAS fellows. Our faculty are the lifeblood of the university and are pivotal in advancing our standards of academic excellence. In fact, I'd like to share with you two examples of fa our faculty members and one alumna who are channeling their creativity to create solutions to some of society's greatest challenges. Please watch the video. I do research related to urban water issues and renewable energy. You know, on this planet you have over a billion people without safe drinking water and 2.4 billion people who are living in poor sanitation conditions. So the um, technology that we're working on uh, is called the new generator, which stands for nutrients, energy, and water generator, where dirty water can be turned into clean water and can be reused again. So we solved the sanitation problem and we solved the water scarcity problem. And the only thing we needed to power this is solar energy. And we we're harnessing nature to make this happen. And one of our goals is actually to create versions that are small enough that you can put them in households. Another sector that we're looking into is actually space. We develop the next version that could be applied to Mars. My name is Maya Trotz, and I'm a professor in civil and environmental engineering at USF. My role at USF is to teach, do research, and do outreach. To me, those things are intermingled and totally connected. So my work is a lot of community-engaged work where I expose my students to working with those around us or those that are connected to us in some way, whether they be here in Tampa Bay or, say, in Placentia in Belize, because we, we are all interconnected in the world and to look at various issues that really and truly address how we live sustainably, um, and in particular, how we protect our waters.
Joanna Fowler brings the power of nuclear technology, originally designed to study the nature of matter, to the study of the brain. Fowler designs radio tracers, or chemical markers, which allow her to track brain activity via PET scan imaging. Addiction is a disease of the brain. From these imaging studies, we've shown very significant differences between the addicted brain and the brain of people who are not using drugs. We are very interested in the reward system, so we look at tracers for dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter involved in reward. Radio tracers have a short life. From creating the tracer, to imaging the patient, to analyzing the results, Fowler's work in the lab must be done at breakneck speed. And the picture that's emerged now from all of these uh, addictions is that it appears that the reward system is understimulated. Not only is the reward system being affected, but so is the frontal cortex. This part of the brain deals with the consequences of behavior such as addiction. And we're finding this pattern over and over, no matter whether you're looking at a cocaine abuser's brain or an alcoholic's brain, someone who abuses heroin or methamphetamine, or an obese person's brain. Fowler has spent a career alongside mentors and colleagues designing radio tracers that have aided in the study of addictions, as well as the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. Her groundbreaking work in developing a radio tracer to track a brain enzyme revealed behavioral patterns associated with cigarette smoking. So it's very reinforcing to work at something on the bench and then end up with some piece of knowledge about the brain that you never knew before. You know, I just lucked out getting into this area, and it's been so amazing being at Brookhaven National Laboratory because you can convene a room full of really smart people very rapidly to work on problems, and I think I'm the world's luckiest person. So one note about Joanna, the last researcher you saw. <laughs> Joanna is not only one of the world's most esteemed researchers, a member of the National Academy of Science, and a recipient of the National Medal of Science by President Obama in 2009. She is a USF alumna and was a member of the very first graduating class at USF. In so many ways, she exemplifies USF, determined, optimistic, and selfless. This spirit of excellence is echoed across our entire community and can be seen in every aspect of our university. Let us now talk about opportunity. The University of South Florida is indeed fortunate to be located in a vibrant urban metropolitan region. Like USF, the Tampa Bay region is not only growing, but growing in the right direction, with a focus on innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. Like USF, the region is becoming increasingly diverse, with potential to shape a new kind of knowledge-based economy that thrives on human capital and nurtures opportunity. But it's still an economy, economy that is nascent relative to other large growing states in our country. To provide some context, last year nearly 80 percent of all venture capital investments went to just three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts. Those three states are also home to 77 percent of Fortune 500 companies. Not coincidentally, those states are also home to some of our most prestigious universities. As I have said, I believe that USF can become to Tampa Bay what Stanford has been to Silicon Valley. Our diverse population in Tampa Bay represents a microcosm of our global society, a fascinating fabric of individuals with innumer an innumerable range of experiences and perspectives and ideas. In fact, USF has no less than 4,620 international students from 141 countries. We also have socioeconomic diversity. No less than 41 percent of our undergraduates are Pell Grant eligible, which means their families come from modest economic circumstances. USF remains not only one of the most diverse institutions in the nation, but most importantly, 
all of our students, regardless of their backgrounds or circumstances, succeed at the same rate here at the university. We retain 89% of our students from the first year to the second year at USF, and we graduate 71% of them in six years. These are incredible accomplishments that we should be very, very proud of. As Sir Malcolm discussed earlier, today's students are more globally informed, more culturally aware, and perhaps more eager than any generation before them to make an immediate impact on the world. In fact, USF is a world leader in providing global opportunities for our students and our faculty. Take, for example, that USF has been the top producer of Fulbright scholarships in the nation for two of the past three years. Indeed. Additionally, just a few days ago, USF won the Platinum Award for Global Learning, Research, and Engagement, which is the highest honor bestowed in this area by the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities. We remain committed to further reinforcing the already inclusive community at our university and, and our campus climate of mutual respect that embraces a diversity of backgrounds and points of view. For example, I've recently announced the formation of a university task force on USF's principles of community. This group of faculty, staff, and students will draft a list of principles that will further cement our inclusivity. Meanwhile, the size and the strength of our research enterprise now rivals those of our aspirational peers within the top ranks of America's most esteemed universities. We now, as I mentioned, have nearly $600 million in total research expenditures. These research activities spur rapidly growing economic impact and job opportunities for our region. This past year alone, our innovation activities generated $582 million annually for our local economy, sustaining more than 4,000 public and private sector jobs. Importantly, USF is an engine to create opportunities for our society because much of our energy is channeled towards practical problems, translational science, and culturally relevant creative works. This work creates opportunities for job creation and promoting prosperity in our region. Of course, it's one thing to measure and quantify this economic and societal impact. It is another to experience it firsthand, as many of our students have. And so I'd like, to hear your, like you to hear directly from some of our students who have experienced the unique opportunities afforded at USF. I'm Caitlin Deutsch, and I'm going to protect biodiversity and ecosystems from human impact. Well, I've always been very deeply fascinated by the natural world. My dad is also a biologist, so as a kid, we would go on family trips, bird watching, hiking, kayaking. Um, so at a very young age, I was really instilled with this idea that nature was a special place. And even within my lifetime, I watched some of these places either be degraded or destroyed completely, and that kind of cemented this idea that I wanted to protect them and not let them be destroyed or degraded any more than they have. The honeybees are the most important pollinators that we have. Just the way they've been domesticated, that we can move hives around the United States to kind of fit our demand for pollination services. There's no other species that could compare to that. My research here at USF with Dr. Gore was really exciting. We brought in frames of newly emerged bees and then exposed them to different treatments of a disease called Nosema, as well as pesticide concentrations. We wanted to see, okay, can we pinpoint what's actually going on in the lab? That's one of the biggest things that brought me to USF, was the caliber of research going on. My ability to start as a sophomore in a professor who has world-renowned research, I don't think I could have done that anywhere else. After I graduated USF in 2015, I um, immediately went to Oxford to begin my master's in biodiversity conservation and management. Um, and I did that through the Frost Scholarship. And the master's itself was an incredible experience to be in, you know, Oxford, which is just this amazing institution. It was really a great <laughs> Ultimately, I hope to make a difference in the world by working at the interface of science and policy in order to safeguard imperiled species and ecosystems 
which wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my experience here at USF and you know, getting involved in research and, and all of these policy discussions at such an early stage. Isn't she amazing? After Oxford, Caitlin is now pursuing her PhD in entomology at Cornell, my alma mater. She is studying the ecology and conservation of insect pollinators and has already received more than $10,000 in grants to fund her research. I'm Michael Calzadilla, and I will discover new insights into our galactic origins. When I was little, I I was obsessed with NASA and I wanted to be an astronaut. Just watching these documentaries on Discovery or Science Channel on TV and you see this thing called a black hole and you're like, wait, what is that? I'm the first person in my family to go to college. I started off as a pre-med student. I met my future advisor. He recommended that I look into these things called RU, which are research experience for undergraduates that are funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, so there are these 10 to 12 week paid internships during the summers that you get to go and do research and try it out and see if you like research or not. I went to the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and there I studied these things called active black nuclei, the black holes that are the center of every galaxy, and they're really active, they're, they're actively feeding. In my second summer, I went to work at the MIT Haystack Observatory. There's a collaboration called the Event Horizon Telescope. You can connect a bunch of them, so essentially you have a telescope that's the size of our country. One of the nice things about USF is that it's, since it's relatively young, you have a lot of room to make your mark. What I did after my REU at MIT, I decided to bring a telescope here and kind of put a spotlight on the physics department on USF and show what students are capable of and also bring in some astronomy to our department. And so I went to the College of Arts and Sciences. I started voting with a few other students. I went and asked students from electrical engineering and, me and mechanical engineering and computer science. Projects are getting bigger and bigger, so we need bigger and bigger um, task forces. Before I came to USF, I had never left the state of Florida. But since then, I've been to seven different countries already. They even gave me a scholarship to travel to Germany. And it really broadened my horizons in a way that, you know, you can't just be in a classroom and read about something if you have to go experience it. I really couldn't have done it without the help of some people here in the physics department and the honors college and office national scholarships especially. It's really opened the universe to me. And I'm studying all these things that are on the frontier of our current understanding. I would say to really read widely and really know what your passions are. You will not regret it following your passion. As for Michael, after he completed his master's in astronomy at the University of Cambridge, he was offered a second Gates Cambridge scholarship to pursue his PhD at Cambridge as well. But he ultimately decided to pursue his PhD in astrophysics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where he's currently working as a Kavli graduate fellow. I'm Dr. Sigrid Soto. I just earned my PhD in communication sciences and disorders. After my undergrad, I did my master's in speech and language pathology. I began working as a clinical speech and language pathologist. I was driving across different neighborhoods within one day and seeing the big disparities in children's education. One neighborhood had it's a beautiful, high quality preschool education where kids were learning Spanish and Chinese, and it was just beautiful. And then within a few blocks, I went to my old neighborhood and I saw the preschoolers there and the preschool setting in itself wasn't up to par. That same day after I saw that, you know, I cried. I called my old mentor and he said, I need to do something about these kids. There's injustices that are placed upon them that limit their educational access. I know that I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing this for kids and families that need it. I want kids to read, and it's my mission in life to help make sure that that's equitable for all kids, not just kids on the right side of the track. Due to the investment USF has done in me, I'm now able to contribute significantly to my field. My graduate experience has given me a platform, it's given me a voice, and it's given me the ability to think critically and problem solve. So I'm not just talking about the problems that are happening in the world, but I'm actually doing something about it. I love that USF is innovative. A lot of universities are kind of stuck in their own ways, and tradition is really valuable. I know at USF, we love tradition but we also really value innovation. And I feel like you wanna be in a place that is naturally geared toward fostering ideas, toward pushing the boundaries. 
being forward thinking and thinking about the future because we are supposed to be training to become leaders of tomorrow. So why not be in a place that fosters that kind of thing? I love her passion. Today, Zigrid is completing a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Kansas, where she's working with young, at-risk, bilingual Latino students to develop more effective literacy teaching methods. So the opportunities that these students experienced are just a few examples of what makes the University of South Florida so unique, the incredible power that comes from combining excellence and opportunity. And we will create ever more opportunities by capturing the synergies between science, engineering, health, and our vital and vibrant liberal arts, humanities, and the visual and performing arts. In fact, I believe that the true future of innovation will be based on a convergence of digital technologies and the humanities, such as the study of languages, culture, ethics, philosophy, and religion. Now this emphasis on the combination of excellence and opportunity is happening today while USF is uniting as one strong university that will serve the entirety of our region. USF consolidation isn't only a combination of our three campuses in Tampa, St. Petersburg, and Sarasota, Manatee. The reunification of our three campuses represents a powerful synthesis whereby the whole will be much greater than the sum of its parts. Our reunification is an extraordinary opportunity for the USF community to strengthen our stature as a preeminent research university and to advance new and innovative ways to serve our students, faculty, staff, alumni, and the broader Tampa Bay region. So in closing, as, to, as of today, I've now been your president for 137 days. Thank you. And during that time, I've had the privilege of listening to and getting to know so many of our talented faculty, dedicated staff, enthusiastic alumni, and supportive advocates, and philanthropic donors. What's remarkable to me is that as diverse a community as we are, there is something that we all have in common. We are driven by a desire to build. We're drawn to USF not because of what we've already done, but because of what we can create together. Today, I've offered my own perspective on how USF is unique. As president, my mission is to build on our momentum, fostering a campus environment for innovation where, where we will relentlessly push forward on both excellence and opportunity. So even more exciting than what USF has accomplished is the extraordinary promise of what it will accomplish in the future. We will accomplish this by expanding our resources through ambitious advocacy to governmental funding sources and to very crucially by expanding our philanthropic support to the university from alumni and friends and by building our endowment. So my singular objective for our university during the remainder of my career will be together with each of you to advance the trajectory of USF to become an overall 25, top 25 public university in the United States. And our ultimate objective is to reach eligibility for membership in the Association of American Universities the 65 top research universities in North America. Wait, you bet, absolutely. We're on that. Ladies and gentlemen, there is so much to be proud of here at USF, and still there is so much ahead for us to do together. Thank you for joining us today for this extraordinary event and for the privilege of allowing me to join you as a member of the University of South Florida community. Thank you. Thank you, President Corral, for your inspiring words and for your vision. Uh, for the University of the University of